my gentle and of course very modern apes. My name is Erica, I'm Gutsy Gibbon, and welcome to another episode of the Library of Error, where we look at pseudoscientific texts and we analyze them for their robusticity. We look at them and see how right they are, because generally speaking, if you're willing to put something to paper, you gotta have at least some confidence in it, I think. Now today, I'm in a bit of a bad mood. We're starting things off in a very uncharitable way because I woke up to this, which is a, a rent in twain toilet paper roll, thanks to the nefarious activities of my three dogs. Why they would do this to me? I don't know. Criminals. Here they come to apologize. They know what they've done. They know what they've done. Gifts will get you nowhere, Teddy. This is a bad girl right here, and a bad boy down here. A duo of miscreants. Just make yourself at home. Contested Bones is meant to debunk the entirety of biological anthropology or human evolution, and it's written by two young Earth creationists named Christopher Roop and Dr. John Sanford. Now, Sanford does genetics, so why he's writing a book that is almost entirely on morphology is beyond me. Christopher Roop has his bachelor's degree in biology, which is good, but not enough to really pull this entire field up from its roots, as you've seen thus far and will continue to see. He lacks the ability to sort of analyze these, these papers that he brings up in a critical way, that's the charitable interpretation. The, um, the uncharitable interpretation, which I'm more prone to believing today, is that there is some intentional deception going on here. And if you think that's jumping the gun, please see the previous episodes where I feel I provide a decent amount of support for the idea that it is physically impossible to <laughs> come up with the, uh, with the readings for this much text, like do enough reading to write this much text on human evolution, and come to the conclusions that you've come to, unless you're being intentionally obtuse. So, with that in mind, we will enter into our next chapter of Contested Bones on Ardipithecus ramidus, a hominin that lived 4.4 billion years ago. Now, for those of you who also, you know, again, maybe coming a bit late, Contested Bones is written by young Earth creationists, so they believe that the Earth was created more or less in its present state 6,000 years ago, and that everything in the Earth, all the organisms in the Earth, gen tends to fall into these categorical progenitor groups. So, you know, cats can evolve within the cats, but they can't evolve into anything else, and they can't descend from anything else as a result. So they propose then that humans are not apes, which if you're thinking, but that's kind of like proposing that dogs aren't canines, you are right. There is no explanation, there is no, like, argument given for why humans aren't apes, which again leads me to believe that there is some obfuscation going on here. Otherwise, how would he get a biology degree and not understand, like, how nested hierarchies work? But I digress. These guys have categorized the hominins, the hominin fossil record, uh, from about 7 million years ago to now, into three categories. The bones of the human type, so they're, they're skeletons, their fossil material that they deem to just be humans. And this pretty much encompasses Homo sapiens to Homo erectus. Then they have their bones of the ape type. These are just apes, if you will. Again, see the canid example, but these are things that they would consider extinct apes that are not related to humans in any way. And in that group, they've categorized Australopithecus afarensis and Ornipithecus ramidus. And the last category is the bones of the middle type which never ceases to amaze me how self-aware wolves this is, right? Like calling it bones of the middle type is just explicitly saying, sorry folks, they're too transitional. And to remind everybody, their explanation for the bones of the middle type is it's a hoax, either accidental or intentional, or number two, um, there is some kind of insane taphonomic bias going on here where you end up with in articulation ape bones and human bones mixing together. We'll, we'll be covering that at extensive length in the Australopithecus sediba chapter, but today we're going over my favorite hominin. Truly, my favorite hominin. And hominins are like some of my favorite animals, so this individual ranks, this individual species I should say, ranks pretty high up there. Ardipithecus ramidus. 
Artie Pithecus Ramidus is cool for a lot of different reasons, and we'll be going through all of them through the length of this chapter. But my reason for making it my favorite is that they're basically like big gibbons, right? They're sexually monomorphic. So males and females with the same size and have the same size canine teeth, which are reduced in both sexes, but you know, still large compared to ours. They lived about 4.4 million years ago. And if the monomorphism of today is anything to go off of, it potentially suggests that these guys pair bonded like modern gibbons, tamarins, and humans, which is neat. We, that's not common, it's not uncommon, but it's not a common strategy that we tend to see in primates and especially apes. So we're gonna be talking about them in a little bit. And hopefully you guys have been catching up with the videos on bipedality that I've been presenting here on the channel, because the argument that Artipithecus is bipedal, at least when it's on the ground, is rooted in the sort of morphologic suites that we've established are necessary for bipedalism in other hominins and in bipeds today, which is of course humans. So we're going to be going over a lot. I'm not saying that you should have done homework, but if you feel the need to pause and go watch those videos, I mean, I don't know, that's free views, baby. I'm not going to complain. We start the Artipithecus Raminus chapter off with Artipithecus Raminus, oldest human ancestor or just extinct ape, or extinct ape, as they say. Where did Artipithecus and the other hominin contenders come from? Are they truly members of the hominin lineage or simply apes among the tangled bushes that constitute the basal hominine bush? This is a quote from Terry Harrison. I am ridiculously familiar with Harrison's work because he is like one of the big guys for Miocene apes along with Peter Andrews and um, a few others here and there. Background and discovery of Arty. In the middle Awash River Valley of Aramis, Ethiopia, 46 miles away from where the remains of Lucy were discovered, fragmentary bones were found and attributed to a new putative species, Artipithecus ramidus, referred to as Arty hereafter. Paleo expert Tim White and his colleagues recovered approximately 45% of the skeleton. It is consisted of broken portions of the skull, jawbone, full set of teeth, vertebral fragments, broken limb bones, a crushed hip, um, and dated to uh, via argon argon method to be about 4.4 million years ago. This is the same questionable method used to date Lucy. See chapter six and 12. Yes, folks, not only do Christopher uh, Roop and John Sanford attempt to debunk all of paleoanthropology, biological anthropology, and sort of an extinct uh, hominin context, but they also want to debunk radiometric dating. Now, the simple proof for radiometric dating, in my opinion, like the easiest way when you're discussing things with creationists, the easiest way to emphasize that radiometric dating does in fact work is to point to the fact that radiometric dating is used in the process of basin modeling, which is done before fossil fuel extraction occurs in a location. Long story short here, the entire fossil fuel industry of the globe depends on radiometric dating being accurate. So, you know, we'll be addressing that when that chapter comes around, but you know, it needs to be said at every given point that radiometric dating is supported every time you fill up your car or heat your house. They continue on and say, according to the claims made throughout the popular press, Artie is man's oldest known ape-like human ancestor. No, uh, even in 2009, this was not true. We already had Sailanthropus chidensis and Aurora antugonensis. Based on Artie's estimated age, it is viewed as the closest hominin species to the split, the human-chimpanzee divergence that allegedly occurred between six to 10 million years ago. Headlines promoted Artie as the discovery of the century, triumphing over the famous Lucy skeleton discovered in 1974. The findings were set to call in, the finding was set to call into question the long-held uh, held evolutionary assumption that humans evolved from a chimp-like ancestor. It would seem already changed everything. Researchers said textbooks needed to be rewritten again, they put in parentheses to emphasize the fact that why won't this damn science quit changing? It needs to be immutable. That's what these guys feel, which is of course dumb because science's ability to change in light of new information is why it's so useful. It's precisely why it is such a great foundation for uh, sort of our, our knowledge base. 
Research, okay, uh, the discovery team claimed Artie was a new kind of ancestor, not resembling a chimpanzee or a human. It is neither ape nor man, yet somehow reveals the surprising ancestry of both. But if Artie did not look like a chimpanzee or any other type of living ape, what did it look like? And how could anyone be so sure the poorly preserved remains belong to an early ape-like human ancestor as opposed to just another extinct ape? Artie was originally classified as being in the same genus as Lucy, Australopithecus. Later, it was reclassified into its own genus, Artipithecus. So before we begin the next chapter, the next paragraph here, which says Artie's pitiful remains and artist imagination, let's discuss a little bit about what was found and why we know so much based off of this one famous skeleton, Artie. So here is the famous Artie skeleton that uh, Sanford and Rip are going to continuously talk about, despite the fact that there is more to the species of Artipithecus than this one specimen. Uh, but we're going to go over this really quick first, because there's something very important that I want to hammer home to you. This skeleton here in A, and this is a little figure, right? Here's A, the skeleton. B is the skeletal reconstruction in drawing form. And C is adding flesh and muscle and fur onto that lattice of the skeleton. But in A, you can see that this is the actual like specimen. This is what we have of Artipithecus, specifically the Arty specimen. And it's about 45% complete. What's the problem here? The issue that Sanford and Roop do not appreciate is that Artipithecus rhamnitus is a mammal. It's bilaterally symmetric, just like we are, which means you can reflect what you have on one side over the sagittal plane in the middle to the other. So on this skeleton drawing right here, if you have the left humerus, you have the right humerus, right? You know what it looks like because it's simply the mirror image of the other side. So we actually have significantly more than 45% of Artie's skeleton if we take into account the fact that it's bilaterally symmetric. So notice we don't have any um, any humeri for this particular specimen, uh, but that being said, we have the whole lower arm, the radius of the ulna, we have a portion of the femoral shaft, the tibia, the fibula, most of the hands and feet, and a whole lot of the skull. We're missing most of the rib cage. We've got some rib, a little bit of the rib here, uh, no scapulae, but boy, this is the big, this is the biggie right here. We've got the pelvis right? We've got the vast majority of the pelvis, the, the whole right ilium, ischium, and then most of the pubis. So what exactly does this skeleton tell us about Artipithecus and how it moved? Well, first and foremost, you can see that it's got this divergent big toe down here, which is very reminiscent of chimps. Interestingly enough, the big toe, the halix, is actually more divergent in Artipithecus than it is in chimps. So why is it depicted as a biped? Why do we have this thing standing upright? What support do we have for the terrestrial bipedal locomotion of Artipithecus rhamnitus? Well, recall, if you will, from previous videos that generally speaking, there's a suite of characteristics that kind of diagnose bipedality in the fossil record. The simple way to put this is if these traits are present, one or more of these traits are present, then you have either probable like bipedality in habitual nature, for sure bipedality in habitual nature, or like an obligate biped. It's always got to walk around on two feet. So what is this suite of characteristics? First is the anterior foramen magnum, the hole at the base of the skull. If that hole at the base of the skull is tucked underneath the skull, then that means that the skull sits directly on top of the vertebral column and necessitates an upright or orthograde posture. This is like necessarily true because if an animal has an anterior or directly underneath foramen magnum and it's quadrupedal then it has to crank its neck back all the time just to see anything right because it's normally if it's quadrupedal it's more plantigrade and then its head is like making it so it's looking down if this is the vertebral column here the head is facing downward that's kind of crazy the other trait that we tend to look at is the nature of the pelvis does the pelvis have a bowl shape for the strengthening of the pelvic floor and anchoring powerful gluteal muscles on the side, right? Typically, when we look at the pelvis, we're looking at the ilia and the ischia, as well as uh, the pubis, but mostly the, these two lateral bones on the side. Humans have a very bowl-shaped pelvis. We have short squat ilia and um, sort of longer um, ischium, not compared to chimps, but compared to the ilium, um, giving the whole pelvis a more bowl shape. Chimps, of course, have the opposite, right? In relation to the knee, for which we have some of in Artipithecus, so we've got the pelvis, we've got the foramen magnum, we have some of the knee, 
Humans have a valgus knee, as does Australopithecus afarensis. This allows us to pull the, the legs underneath the body and hold the weight directly above it, as you can see in this Arnipithecus individual here. So having a valgus knee means that this um, the knee comes in, the femur comes in at an angle to, it's called a bicondylar angle, to the condyles right here, where the patella is, so that you can pull those legs up underneath. And the last characteristic has to do with the foot morphology. This is the three arches in the foot. Your arches in your feet allow you to transfer, distribute weight when you're rolling your foot as you take a step, and an inline helix or big toe, which also aids in that. So let's assess Arnipithecus for these characteristics of bipedality. Humans have all of them. Australopithecus afarensis has all of them too. So surely we should have a transitional fossil at some point during the fossil record that has only some of the bipedalism characteristics. What does Arnie have? Well, first and foremost, let's appreciate the foramen magnum. This is a licensed replica of Ardipithecus ramidus's skull, specifically that, that Ardi specimen. And as you can see, we've got a whole lot of the right portion of the face, the maxilla, and the sort of orbits, the zygomatics, and the cranium. And so you can just mirror that over, and that's how you know what this section looks like, even though this section wasn't exactly preserved. So let's take a look at the foramen magnum, this hole at the base of the skull under here. What you can see is that we have a lot of the left part of the foramen magnum, including the occipital condyle, the left occipital condyle, which is this little lumpy portion right here. If you mirror this portion of the circle that we have preserved over, you've got the vast majority of the foramen magnum, and it's very much pushed up underneath the skull. So we know that Ardipithecus has an anterior foramen magnum. And to kind of illustrate what I was saying earlier, this means that the skull has to actually sit on top of the vertebral column like this. If the foramen magnum came out at an angle, right, then you would know that it's probably quadrupedal or at least a knuckle walker. But if the foramen magnum is the anterior, as we see in Ardipithecus, and this thing turns out to be a quadruped, it's gonna be looking down all the time. This is what I mean by having to crank the neck forward. It doesn't work. Anterior foramen magnum with a forward angle, the angle and the position are both important with regard to um, determining locomotion on the basis of the foramen magnum position. Uh, they both have to be pushed forward. It's gotta angle forward and it's gotta be forward on the skull itself. So the foramen magnum supports bipedality, at least on the ground for Arnipithecus raminus. Now, there's a difference between posture and locomotor style. So the foramen magnum definitely tells us, without a doubt, that this thing is orthograd, that it's upright, that the skull sits directly on top of your vertebral column. But you can have an orthograd posture and still be in the trees. So let's assess what else we have to see if we can infer the locomotor pattern of Ardipithecus. Looking at the pelvis next, you can see that the pelvis was horribly crushed. And this is true. Um, Sanford and Rupert are going to make a big to-do about the nature of the pelvis having to be reconstructed, but Ardipithecus rambidus was discovered in the late 90s, and it was not published on until 2009. Contrary to what we saw with Sailanthropus chidensis's femur, this required a load of reconstruction. So that massive gap in time is indicative of the sort of meticulous nature of reconstructing this thing, if anything. The reconstruction of the pelvis tells us a couple of things. As you can see in this drawing over here, and hopefully in a little bit in the specimen, we can see that the ilium is rotated forward and it's short and squat more like a human pelvis than like a chimpanzee's. So that short ilium, the ilium is that blade of the pelvis and it's squashed down more like that of a human as compared to a chimp. So let's look up a human pelvis here and you can see Short squat ilium, hopefully you can see that. Short squat ilium as compared to the ischium, which is this bone that's sort of below the socket where the femur fits in. The acetabulum is the name of this sort of socket here and the ischium is down here. So looking instead at a chimpanzee pelvis for our hopeful comparison here, chimp pelvis, you can see a drastic difference, right? This is the male chimpanzee pelvis, tall ilium, excuse me, um, and even a tall ischium. So generally speaking, Ardipithecus ramidus has a sort of derived, wait a second, a derived ilium and a primitive ischium. 
The pubis, which is this bone in the front, is going to be more derived as well. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so we got the bipedal foramen magnum, the orthoid bipedal foramen magnum, a bipedal pelvis, at least in part of it. And the specific parts um, that are derived here is it's actually got, and we'll, we'll get to this in a second, um, a notch, a very important notch of bone on the ilium, or on the ischium, excuse me, for a muscle attachment side that is specifically used in bipedalism. Right, so the gait of this thing based off of the muscle attachment site that is preserved on the ilium indicates bipedal locomotor style. The knee is considered semi-valgus, but not all the way. So that's again, something transitional going on here. And the foot is particularly interesting. You would look at this thing and you would say it's primitive. That's the primitive aspect of the foot. But actually the foot is a mosaic. The halix is primitive. That, that big toe is jutting right out to the side, um, probably to stabilize it when it's standing still. But the lateral or outside edge of the foot has an arch. Chips have zero arches in their feet. Humans have three. Australopithecus afarensis has three. Uh, and this thing's got one. So that's an interesting little tidbit. And it's the lateral arch, the one that is uh, stays stiff when you're rolling the weight through the outside of the foot. So the overall suite of characteristics for what is preserved in Artipithecus ramidus is that of a mosaic. It is that of a transitional biped. There is no doubt that this thing was still spending time in the trees, but there is no Miocene ape and no living ape that has a pelvis like this thing. It is intermediate to that which we see in uh, something that is a committed arboreal suspensory animal like a Miocene ape like Danuvius and something that we see in humans or australopiths. So this is a very, very interesting animal to say the least. Let's see how Sanford and Roop um, handle it. Arnie's bone fragments were discovered in 1992 in the Middle Awash region. A full analysis of the remains was not published until 17 years later in 2009. This is true. So they go through and talk about how there was a lot of reconstruction and cast doubt because a reconstruction had to happen. That's fine. Um, and I noted here over on this picture that, you know, we're going to need to mirror this actual skeleton in order to appreciate how much is preserved truly in Artipithecus ramidus. They go, although the bones were incomplete and badly damaged, the researchers immediately assumed they had found the world's oldest human ancestor. Um, where? Because there's no citation for this. I just put on the basis of what, right? Finding Artipithecus ramidus just on the teeth alone, right? The teeth were discovered first, which is initially why this thing was put in the Australopithecus as a primitive member of Australopithecus. It wasn't until the rest of the skeleton was discovered that they were able to go, oh shit, this thing is super, super different from any of the Australopiths that we have um, for a number of reasons that we'll go over soon. But like, that would mean that it's a hominin. So assuming basing, based on the teeth alone that you've got the oldest hominin back in the 90s was fair because at that time it was. Salanthropus wasn't reported on until the, the early 2000s or roaring even a little bit later. They say premature conclusions of this type reveal a treasure hunt mentality. <laughs> the strong desire to discover a missing link no doubt clouded their ability to be objective. Absolutely freaking not, right? There are distinct characteristics that mark hominins and Artipithecus had them. It's as simple as that. There is no like room there to dream up, like, you know, to dream up associations. It's either present or it's not. Now, this of course does get difficult when we're talking about like degrees of things, which is going to be harder the closer you get to the common ancestor of humans and chimps, but these are bones, right? You, you, you can't manipulate bones very much, at least when you're looking at something as well preserved as the ulna, which is right there. Like, it, does it have notches or does it not? Okay. Wine and colleagues first proclaimed to the world that they had found the oldest human ancestor in 1994. The only available remains that were, that were uh, analyzed at that time were teeth um, and a few pieces of the skull and arm, like the, probably the ulna and the radius. The researchers had no way of knowing for sure whether these loose teeth or bone fragments belonged to a single species, let alone a new species. 
and they had no direct evidence these bones were from an early precursor to man. White acknowledged that out of all the recovered remains, no skeletal parts were found articulated. The remains were completely disconnected and were scattered across a widely excavated area. The initial fragments were as far apart as one mile, and subsequently recovered bone fragments were spread over a total distance of four miles. So this is a bit misleading, I think, because we're talking about the remains there back in 1994 of the several individuals that were found, not of the specific skeleton. Now, that being said, let's take a step back and appreciate what they said about the teeth and how on the basis of the teeth, they had no way of knowing whether they belonged to a single species, let alone a new species, and had no direct evidence these bones were from an early precursor to man. You can absolutely, on the basis of teeth, designate a new species. If you find a tooth that looks like nothing we've seen before, it's probably a new species, right? That is not like a far stretch at all. And if all the new teeth that you discover, like all of the teeth that you discover within a certain category, so like all the I1s, all the third molars, whatever, all of them look the same, it's pretty fair to say that these teeth, as far as we know, are from the same species. This is not rocket science. And again, is very, you know, revealing that Roop has no training in paleontology or anything similar to it, evidently not anatomy either. They had no idea that this could be a precursor to man or not thing that they just said is also really silly because human evolution makes a very simple hypothesis. We have the human condition, the anatomically modern human condition, and we have that of modern apes and that of much older, more ancient apes. If human evolution is legit, we should find a slow morphologic change through geologic time moving from these primitive characteristics, primitive suites of characteristics, to the derived ones. So on the basis of the teeth alone, human molars are a bit different, although not that different, from chip molars or, you know, ancient Miocene ape molars. However, they do have a few distinguishing characteristics that someone with a keen eye could potentially tell, right? So, yes, you can evaluate that hypothesis on the basis of these molars. If these molars occupy some kind of intermediate period between modern human molars and these Miocene ape molars, then you could in fact say that they are in line or at least congruent with the idea of them belonging to a transitional species. They talk more about how fragile the bones were before going on to say what they came up with, that being the reconstruction that was published, was a very apish looking creature, but supposedly standing perfectly erect with infer hips and spine that were made to appear human. Um, now I've underlined that because that's of course assigning nefarious agency to Tim White and colleagues. But that being said, we just looked at the skeleton for like 20 minutes and you saw the pelvis, you saw the nature of the pelvis. This thing is not made up or inferred, it is simply assessed. Now, yes, it is reconstructed, and we're going to look at a reconstruction of the pelvis here in a little bit, a paper on the reconstruction of the pelvis here in a little bit. Uh, with regard to the spine, the spine is inferred on the morphology of the pelvis, right? So usually this is done with the sacrum, the superior surface of the sacrum, but you can still infer lordosis, which is the curvature of the lower back, uh, on the basis of the rest of the pelvis. So yes, that's inferred, the pelvis is not and the spine is not unjustly inferred, I suppose I should say. One of the most popular illustrations of already seen in the 2009 discovery paper published in Science, this bizarre interpretation of the bones was strategic to promoting the claim that Artie was an early human ancestor that evolved not long after the alleged chimp human lineage split sometime six million years ago. The image of Artie reveals an overall ape-like anatomy. However, its upright human posture, lumbar lordosis, and mid-stride human gait gives the misleading impression that Artie was somehow more than an ape and was undergoing dramatic evolution to become human. To support this notion, the discovery team claimed that Artie had a mixture of ape and human traits. I just put it did. We just went over this looking at the skeleton. Uh, but over here, they, they again say, Artie is shown mid-stride with a normal human gait. This is not a normal human gait, right? Biomechanics involve several phases and stances, especially looking at the evolution of bipedalism in humans. Um, this is indicative of a bent hip, bent knee over here, which is like the opposite of a human gait in the literature, 
right? Like it's literally the opposite, the, the sort of baseline of the evolution of bipedalism. So this is not shown as a human gait. It's shown as a, a bent knee, right? Um, yeah, the posture is upright, but again, we just went over the suite of characteristics that Artie has that doesn't only imply, but necessitates the upright posture. Okay, they got me turning into an Italian here. Um, and then they say, the reconstructions of which have been heavily criticized by other experts in the field. Citation needed, my friends. Um, I don't know anybody who has a problem with the Artipithecus reconstruction today, so please provide one that is relevant today or even in the past. This would have been a perfect opportunity to put a little number and put your citation down here, but they don't even, they don't even do that, which is very concerning. Wherever the skeleton was well preserved, it was clearly an ape, and all parties agreed. This included an ape sized brain case between 300 and 350 uh, cc's, overall ape like body proportions with long upper limbs compared to lower limbs, long and curved fingers and toes, typical of tree dwelling primates, and ape like feet with a highly divergent opposable great toe indistinguishable from a chimp's. Do you guys notice anything strange about what they just said? They just said, the parts where the skeleton was well preserved, it was clearly an ape. And then they just list characteristics that support their notion and ignore the ones that don't. Let's look at the skeleton again to show you what I mean. Here we are again back with Artie. Let's appreciate what they just noted. They talked about the size of the brain case. Absolutely, I would agree. Artipithecus has a small brain case. So does Australopithecus actually as a genus. Brain case evolution, as we've established many times on this channel, reflective of the literature is like the last thing to evolve. But you know, the face also has the head and face, the skull and face, actually has a lot of derived aspects to it as well. It's reduced in its prognathism. The canines are reduced. It's got more of a parabolic palate than what came before it, and the foramen magnum is anterior. So they just listed the primitive characteristic of the skull and ignored the derived characteristics. Um, to say that the preserved portions of the skull support them is to imply that the skull is well preserved so therefore the rest of it can be assessed in earnest as well. Um, so you can't use it to support you and then ignore the parts that don't support you, right? Um, what else did they say? They talked about the proportions. Absolutely, the proportions of this thing are primitive. It's got long arms relative to the legs, uh, except then they go on to ignore the fact that aspects of the legs, namely the knee and the feet, the arch and the foot uh, are derived. Right, so again, we, we bring up the primitive part and ignore the derived part. If you say it's well preserved, then you can assess both. Then they go on to say that the curved fingers and toes are typical of tree dwelling primates. True, it does have curved fingers and curved toes, but then they again ignore the lateral stiffening of the foot, which is indicative of an arch, which is derived. Then they say the ape-like feet with the highly divergent opposable great toe, indistinguishable from a chimps. Uh, as I said earlier, it's actually more divergent than a chimps. And this has to do with stabilizing the stance or stabilizing the body during the stance phase, which we're going to talk about in a little bit once we get to the main paper that we're going to be going over, which is open access. It's available on ResearchGate, so we can go over the whole thing. So moving on. These guys, make myself big again, they show a picture of a bonobo with Artipithecus, uh, and this is actually used, Friends of All has used this, and it <sighs> characterizes David Begun, who I have met uh, and enjoy a great amount of his work as a paleo expert. This is uh, the comparison of the two. Absolutely. In fact, friend, like I said, Friends of All has also compared Artipithecus to the bonobo, suggesting, and use, using kind of in his argument, that uh, we descend from something that was more bonobo-like than something that was more chimp-like. Uh, except in this comparison of these two individuals, there are some stark differences going on in the musculoskeletal system, which we've already discussed, and we'll discuss more a little bit later. These imaginative reconstructions, skull and hip, <laughs> were used to justify the very questionable assumption that Artie was, had an essentially human spine. So they say this actually, I jumped the gun a little bit. This is consistent with paleo experts who insists that Artie is nothing more than an extinct ape. So what evidence is suggested 
uh, by the discovery team that Artie was an early upright walking ancestor to man. The evidence is primarily in the very poor reconstructions of the certain features that made Artie appear more human, namely the crushed skull, shattered hip, and teeth. Uh, so the teeth are actually very well preserved, right? The enamel is like enamel is one of the most resilient biological uh, substances out there. But wait a second. They just said that the skull was indicative of an, the well-preserved, wherever the skeleton was well-preserved, it was clearly an ape. And then they go on to talk about the skull. It's the first thing they bring up. Is it well-preserved or is it not? Can you use it to support your case or not? Right? Anyways, the hip. We're going to go over the hip reconstruction probably in a little bit. Uh, and then they go on to say these imaginative reconstruction skull and hip were used to justify the very questionable assumption that already had an essentially human spine. Now the citations that they use uh, to support their already, to make already appear more human are all 2009, 14, or 2009, 2015, and 2016, which are all in support of Artipithecus being upright. And I know because one of the papers we're gonna be going over, the original 2009 paper, and then the other one is by Tim White, and then the other one is by uh, Bernard Wood and Terry Harrison, Terrence Harrison. So their citations, which they have here, mislead a reader to thinking, ah, these are going to be people who, people who agree that these are poor reconstructions, but they're citing the reconstructors, right? The reconstructors aren't going to say their own work is poor. And nor do they, because I because I've read these papers, right? It's just, ooh, these guys are so keen to point out nefarious intent in others because they themselves have nefarious intent, is my thought. Let's examine each claim separately and see why leading experts in the field reject the interpretation of White et al. that Arnie walked erect and was our ancestor. Okay, let's do that. Artie's ape skull. A key piece of evidence presented by White et al. that Artie walked upright was the inferred placement of the foramen magnum. Yes, excellent. I'm glad we're going to be addressing this. This is the hole at the base of the skull that indicates the angle of head to spine connection. In many apes, the foramen magnum is positioned towards the rear of the skull. This allows the spine to project outward at an angle and create the characteristic bent hip, bent knee posture of apes. What is this, you guys? What is this over here? What is this supposed to be? Is this not bent hip, bent knee? Okay, then they say, in humans, the foramen magnum is positioned directly under the base of the skull, which is conducive for standing and walking upright. Yes, excellent. This feature is traditionally believed to be indicative of habitual bipedal locomotion, walking on two legs like humans. Awesome, great job so far. Artie's skull was reconstructed to suggest a foramen magnum similar to humans' position, similar to the human position. On the surface, this may sound like a convincing piece of evidence, but there are problems with this interpretation. Yes, tell me the problems. First, it is important to realize that the researchers were dealing with a skull that was broken into 100 pieces and severely crushed down to four centimeters in height. Um, yes, yeah, the, 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 skulls, the skull was broken into pieces and the pieces were all together and that was about that tall. Yes, okay. The remains were in such bad shape that they had to digitally reconstruct it using a CT scanner and then piece it together like a puzzle. Dis digital reconstructions are known to involve quite a bit of uncertainty and guesswork compared to physical reconstructions. There's no citation there. On the basis of what? Are, are CTs worse than physical? Evolutionary paleoanthropologist John Hawks acknowledges this, writing, on one hand, a model referring to the digital reconstructive process greatly facilitates the description and comparison of the specimen with other key fossils. But on the other hand, any model comes with a load of assumptions which may not be explicit when anatomical comparisons are made. So how does that have to do with the digital versus physical? Any reconstruction is going to involve some assumptions, I would imagine, although these assumptions are not present when there's direct articulation or with bones or pieces of bones which is the case for much of Artie. I also wrote on the side, not with landmarks, which the landmarks are absolutely key, right? Like if you can establish landmarks that are for sure present, then that increases confidence with regard to the placement of bones that are close to those landmarks. Closer to a landmark that is for sure, of which there are many, for example, the occipital condyle that we talked about earlier, more confident you can be. They show a picture from one of the, from one of the papers. Moreover, sizable portions of the skull were entirely absent. This, there was certainly a lot of leeway in deciding how the fragmentary remains were pieced together, including the placement of the frame and magnum. In their science report describing the anatomy of the skull, researchers confess that they had made an allowance for the post-mortem damage of the fossils. 
yeah, you, you do that with fossils, but confess, really? Like what? Like they're they're under interrogation? The problem is no one but the digital reconstruction artists know for sure just how much allowance was deemed permissible to the science process of reconstruction. There can be little doubt that the interpreter bias played a significant role in the assembly. W what bias is that? It reportedly took thousands of hours to digitally reconstruct the skull. Yes, until the researchers were happy with the outcome, there were 11 reconstructions. Uh, yes, because you have to make sure that the reconstruction is anatomically copacetic, right? You can't have some portions be wholly correct and then not mesh with another portion that is wholly correct. Th they're implying that all of these 11 other reconstructions, they, they say this here, we don't know why the other 10 previous reconstructions were not chosen to represent Artie. We do, because they weren't anatomically feasible. Given the severely crushed and fragmentary nature of the skull, by the way, they're implying that the reason that they weren't used and this one was is that because it took 11 tries to get it to look human, right? But at the same time, they show this picture and note that when you compare them side by side, Artie looks like a regular old ape, quote unquote. So is the reconstruction correct and it looks like an ape? Or is the reconstruction incorrect and we can't say anything about it? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Then they say, given the severely crushed and fragmentary nature of the skull, it seems any version could have been just as valid as any other. Examination of the skull pieces, figures five and six, suggests that the base of the skull is not even present. The part of the skull needed to locate the foramen magnum. What? Okay, so this is what I mean by dishonest, right? You can't get away with this, not on my watch. The foramen magnum is right there. In fact, it's not the only portion of the ventral side of the skull that we even have. What are you talking about? Let me just read that again, right? So, while holding Artie so that you can see exactly how absurd this is. Examination of the skull pieces, figures five and six, suggest the base of the skull is not even present. And then they put in parentheses the part of the skull needed to locate the foramen magnum. Now, here's a little interesting tidbit into my, my conspiracy theory that these that Roop knows exactly what he's doing here. These two figures come from a paper. Let's look at that paper now. Here's the paper, open access through ResearchGate, so protected from copyright. This paper is titled The Artipithecus Rabidus Skull and Its Implication for Hominoid Origins. Hominid Origins, excuse me. Um, that should look familiar. Here it is, it's the same picture. Um, and that bottom picture right here should also look familiar because scrolling down, there it is. They've taken the top portion. Okay, what other pictures are in this, uh, are in this, um, paper, you guys. We're scrolling, we're scrolling. Do you see this right here? This ventral view of the skull that shows the foramen magnum's curvature right there in articulation with another massive portion of this temporal occipital region here? Exactly how stupid do you think I am, Christopher Roop? Exactly how dumb do you think the rest of your audience is? This is insulting. Again, examination of the skull pieces, figures five and six, suggest that the base of the skull is not even present. Then what is this? This picture of the base of the skull you just said isn't present in the paper where you stole the other two images from? It is not possible to read this paper and get those pictures and not see this image. This is a bold faced lie, if I have ever seen one. Unless of course, we're not actually reading the papers that we're citing and pulling pictures from in our book. And instead we're going on Google images and musing about them. Which is more likely to you, dear viewer? At this point, I think
think you know my opinion. I think it's a little column A, a little column B. Contested Bones is the result of more than four years of intense research into the primary scientific literature concerning those bones that are thought to represent the transitional forms between ape and man. This book's title reflects the surprising reality that all the most famous hominin bones continue to be fiercely contested today, even within the field of paleoanthropology. This work is unique in that it is the most comprehensive, systematic, and up-to-date book available that critically examines the major claims about various hominin fossils. Even though the topic is technical, the book is accessible for a broad audience and is reported to be engaged even for non-technical people. Contested Bones provides new insights regarding the history of paleoanthropology and the sequence of discoveries that bring us up to the current state of confusion within the field. The authors provide alternative interpretations of the hominin species. Surprisingly, the conclusions of the authors consistently find strong support from various experts within the field. For the last five years, Chris has been researching human evolution in the hominin fossil record. Chris has been studying paleoanthropology in depth, which has required the study of hundreds of technical papers, dozens of related books. According to the senior co-author, John on Sanford. Chris's research on the topic is similar in scope and depth to a PhD research project and his enormous contribution to the writing of this book is comparable to a PhD dissertation. It should go without saying, but a mistake this egregious would get you expelled from your PhD program and blackballed from any other PhD programs. In this little box up here, they also mention Ramapithecus punjabicus, which was subsumed into Shivapithecus decades ago. Like, decades and decades and decades ago. It is absolutely insane to me that something like this is allowed to just exist out there and be wrong. I'm actually like conflicted with regard to whether this text, I've been bouncing back and forth this entire time and probably will continue to, like, like is this intentionally deceptive or is it just so incompetent because I have to think that if it was intentionally deceptive, it's actually incompetent at that as well. Because it's not even good at hiding the point. So maybe we're dealing with some kind of hybrid creature here. They <laughs> go on to say, for the sake of argument, let's assume the anterior placement of the foramen magnum was accurate. They know the argument is weak. They are aware. Would it be a convincing argument that Artie was a bipedal hominin ancestor? Stop. No, it would be a convincing argument that Artie Pithecus was orthograde or upright, which is a prerequisite of being bipedal, right? Every kind of bipedal creature has an anterior frame and magnum that's angled forward. Not every single creature with an anterior frame and magnum is bipedal, although in conjunction with the angle, they are. So, so this is wrong on multiple levels. They go, they, they cite Terry Harrison and Bernard Wood, uh, where they note that in an article that Wood and Harrison were on, they point out that foramen magnums in gibbons, which are orthograde in the trees, and bipedal on the ground is similar to that that we see in humans. And then they say, see, this, they actually quote them, they say, they explain that the placement of the foramen magnum at the base of the skull has more to do with the features of the face and the placement of the head than with an upright posture and bipedal locomotion. They note that there is a lack of empirical evidence to clearly support a functionally based correlation between foramen magnum position and bipedalism. You see how they tried to sneak in upright posture there? Because that's just not true. An anterior foramen magnum necessitates upright posture. Bernard Wood and, um, and Terry Harrison are talking about how it's not indicative of a pure correlation, I guess I should say, between bipedalism and an anterior foramen magnum. I've set up here a little display so you can see what I mean. Artipithecus is there on the far left with Homo sapiens in the middle, and the gibbon is on the right. Specifically, it's Artipithecus remitus, Homo sapiens, and Syndactylus symphalangus, or the Simon gibbon. What I hope is immediately obvious is that the foramen magnums of Artipithecus and Homo sapiens are similar and more similar to the exclusion of the gibbon, which has an anterior foramen magnum, but notice the angle. The angle is forward or directly down in Artipithecus and Homo sapiens, and it is angled backwards in the gibbon. So what this should tell us is that the angle and the location of the foramen magnum can indeed help us diagnose locomotor style. Something that's anterior, a foramen magnum that is tucked up underneath the skull or more anterior, definitely tells us whether something is orthograde or not, but the angle also can tell us a lot about the locomotion, something that I feel contested bones did not honestly represent.
As a quick aside as well to the statements by Wood and Harrison on the Furim and Magnum position, again, they're right on the position, but the angle and the position or the orientation and the position together can tell us quite a bit about locomotion. At least it can discriminate between uh, bipedalism and other forms. So this is a paper that's actually pretty critical of the usage of Furim and Magnum position and locomotion, as well as posture. It was published pretty recently in July 2020. But what they specifically note is that they use several different indices with regard to the Furim and Magnum's position and angle. And they say, our analysis indicates that none of the indices or approaches provide complete discrimination across locomotor or postural categories, although some differences are highlighted. Furim and Magnum angle and the BABP, which is one of the specific indices that they use, distinguish respectively obligate and facultative bipeds from all other groups. So what does this mean? This means that individuals that walk upright consistently or individuals that walk upright sometimes, the habitual bipeds, which is what is proposed for Ardipithecus ravidus, are completely um, distinguishable when using the frame and magnum orientation and position from all other groups. So with respect to how I utilize frame and magnum position and angle, this paper supports everything that I have said on this channel continuously. And then they go on to, to talk a little bit more about where these certain uh, variables fail to distinguish between other types of primate locomotor styles. So I just wanted to get that out there, you know, jump ahead of people saying, aha, but have you considered? Yes, I have. They say, all in all, all things considered, there is nothing about the skull that indicates Artie was an ancestor to man. They're concluding that the skull is just an ape. So I've pulled up this paper. Uh, it was actually one of the original papers published on Ardipithecus titled Ardipithecus Pyramidus and the Paleobiology of Early Hominids. So I want to look at this together with you, specifically the characters assessed in the context of other types of hominids. So let's make this uh, viewable here. The assembly of shared derived characters among early hominid taxa. So the chimpanzee human LCA is inferred over here on the far left. And this column over here in all blue represents the primitive characteristics. And specifically, they're using a chimpanzee as a stand in here. Then Ardipithecus uh, ramidus cadat, or Ardipithecus ramidus is sort of precursor species. These are the ones that come before Ardi, including Ardipithecus cadava, Salectomus chidensis, and Aurorotuidensis. Here in the middle is Ardipithecus ramidus' assessment for these characters, then Australopithecus enimensis and Australopithecus afarensis. So where does Ardipithecus fall with relation to its comparison to the chimpanzee stand-in? Well, as contested bones just informed us, there's nothing about it that looks derived. So let's see that for ourselves in the craniomandibular characteristics here. So with regard to the articular eminence, it's got a flat one, right? This is more like the chimpanzee. The mandible corpus breadth is more derived than what we see in chimps. It's got a broader one, uh, much more in line with what we see in humans and Australopiths, respectively. It has a more derived mental foramen. It has a weak mandibular lateral prominence. This is more primitive. So, so far, we have two things with chimpanzees and two things that are derived. With regard to the ramus root, it is primitive. With regard to the symphysial inclination, it is primitive. It's strong, just like chimpanzees. However, it is derived with regard to the Bayesian position and the cranial base flexion. It's got the anterior condition, much like modern humans and australopiths. Then it has uh, primitive characteristics with the mid-facial breath, zygomatic root, and incisor lower canine step. So for the craniomandibular characteristics, it's a mixed bag. So not, as they said, the case where there is nothing about it that is derived about the skull, which is kind of interesting. We're gonna be doing this uh, as we continue, but really the, the main thing that I want you to take away from that is the fact that contested bullets is wrong again. The dental characteristics, Boy, look at all that yellow. Remember, yellow means it's derived and blue means it's primitive. So remember when they te kept telling us earlier that there's nothing about dental characteristics that can be used to define a new species uh, or say that something is, you know, derived or primitive as compared to man? Well, we're going to find a little bit. We're going to, you know, F around and find out with regard to that as well. So let's let them continue on. Next, we get to talk about the pelvis. Are these ape hip, they said. 
The claim that Artie was an early upright walking ancestor to man largely rests upon the highly questionable digital reconstruction of the fragmentary hip bone. Anatomist Stowen Lovejoy of Kent State University was given the role of digitally reconstructing Artie's crushed hip. Lovejoy is the same scientist responsible for reconstructing Lucy's hip. It is quite clear that Lovejoy digitally reconstructed the hip to look the way he imagined to support the preconceived idea that Artie walked habitually upright like modern humans. So they're basically like, yeah, Lovejoy set out with both Australopithecus afarensis and Artiopithecus rabidus to say that this thing is going to have a human-like hip. It's just, again, it's assigning nefarious agency to these guys without actually considering the work, the argument that was put forward. Lazy. <laughs> the inconsideration of the severely crushed and distorted hip, Lovejoy could have reconstructed it to look any way he wanted, figure eight. And then it's just a grainy picture of the crushed hip. I'm not kidding, it's pretty grainy. Um, like the skull, the hip had to be digitally reconstructed using a CT scanner and required just as much imagination. There's never any citations for any of this, you know, imagination using reconstru during reconstruction. Leading evolutionary paleoanthropologists were skeptical of Lovejoy's analysis. In the annual review of anthropology, Craig Sanford, Stanford, excuse me, the evolutionary paleoanthropologist from the University of Southern California lists numerous criticisms of the claims made regarding Artie, including the hip reconstruction. Quote, the reconstruction by White et al. of the Artipithecus fossils as hominin, although argued from a variety of morphological traits, ultimately rests on the imaging of the pelvis. Um, not true, actually. Hominin characterization has more to do initially with the uh, nature of the nuchal plane on the, on the skull and the reduction of canines. They say, as Lovejoy et al. pointed out, the pelvic remains were so severely crushed that as many as 14 reconstructions via the uh, computer CT scanning uh, were considered before deciding which morphology was most in line with data. As Harrison and Wood pointed out, a substantial degree of speculation went into the final morphology of the pelvis reconstruction. Subtle changes in the reconstructive process may have yielded a far more ape-like postcranial anatomy. So this is the this is the citation that they're using to say leading evolutionary paleoanthropologists were skeptical of the analysis. Pointing out that there could be limitations is not the same thing as being skeptical. But still, I'd like to look into this a bit more. Case in point, uh, here's the abstract from the citation here. This one that's titled, uh, or by uh, Craig Stanford. The, <laughs> the living great apes, and in particular the chimpanzee, has served as a model of the behavior and ecology of the earliest hominins for many decades. They talk about the reconstructions, uh, calling into question the relevance of great ape models. So he's saying that the reconstruction calls into question previous ideas of hominin evolution, which is true because it suggests bipedalism uh, being much earlier of an adaptation. I argue, Craig argues, that the Artipithecus fossil strongly support a chimpanzee model for early hominin behavioral ecology. They, meaning the Artipithecus reconstructions and material, indicate a chimpanzee-like hominoid that appears to be an early biped or semi-biped adapted to both terrestrial and arboreal substrates. So this is the guy, this is their guy, the guy that they're using to say that Artipithecus is just another ape, indistinguishable from a chimpanzee. Uh, and then the author in the citation they're using says that it appears to be an early biped or semi-biped in terrestrial and arboreal substrates. Awesome job, you guys. They cite uh, Youngers and also Carol Ward, who I know uh, with regard to their skepticism on certain aspects of the reconstruction. Actually, really, Youngers is the only one, Bill Youngers is the only one who's saying that he's not quite convinced. Of course, this was from 2010, so I wonder if 12 years later he feels any differently. And Carol Ward notes that she suspects that Artipithecus probably shifted its weight from side to side. I tend to trust Carol Ward. I think she does really awesome work, so I'm not going to cast any doubt there, nor am I going to cast any doubt on Bill Junger's skepticism. What I am going to do, however, is look at the pelvis and see what it tells us. So here's another paper. This one was uh, also from 2009, I believe, and it's also found through ResearchGate, so open access uh, gang over here. The pelvis and femur of Artipithecus ramidus, the emergence of walking upright. So here is Homo sapiens in this sort of figure over here, and then Australopithecus afarensis, the reconstruction of Artipithecus ramidus, and Pantroglodytes, which is a chimpanzee. 
Um, the chimpanzee is not rotated here, right? The acetabulum is facing forward in all of these pictures, but you should notice that the ilium, or the blade of the pelvis, is facing us in Pantroglodytes as opposed to Articopithecus ramidus and the others. This is because chimpanzees are known for having coronally oriented iliac blades, whereas in humans we have sagittal ones. They've oriented out into the side to allow for anchoring our powerful gluteal muscles. Now, when looking at this uh, image, you should immediately know that, again, this is the reconstruction, but let's see which features of the pelvis we can identify. This reconstruction has some yellow arrows here that are pointing to the anterior inferior iliac spine. The anterior inferior iliac spine here, here, here is missing in chimpanzees. And it's an important muscle attachment site related to bipedality that only humans have today, but many of our ancestors had. So I wanna scroll down here and look at this picture, figure one. Figure one is our original sort of reconstruction and then the nice smoothing out. So looking at this reconstruction here, like to me, the anterior inferior iliac spine is, is pretty obvious. And that alone uh, is enough as far as I'm concerned to indicate that this thing is moving in a unique way as compared to the Miocene apes that came before and specifically in a more bipedal fashion. It's very interesting to me that none of these figures are included or critically assessed in contested bones. Uh, this feels open and shut. I mean, yes, I, I would wholeheartedly agree that moving from sort of the black column there all the way over to the nice, smooth, uh, full reconstruction, there's probably some wiggle room there, but the general shape is pretty hard to mess up. The section on Artie's ape spine is not really notable for much. Basically, we don't have any lumbar vertebra for Artipithecus ramidus, so they're upset that lumbar lordosis, or the curvature of the lower back, is inferred for Artipithecus. And in fact, they're very mad about it. To the degree that <laughs> to the degree that they say the assumption that Artie exhibited a human-shaped lower spine was essential to substantiate their claim that Artie walked like us. Lovejoy understood this. Therefore, human lordosis was invented to promote Artie as an upright walking ancestor to man. But the simple fact is no lower vertebra were recovered. This means that the artist's renditions in museums show Artie, that show Artie with a human-like lumbar curvature have no supporting evidence. They're essentially a fabrication. So to me, this is very silly. It's presented like this massive gotcha, like, see, there weren't any lumbar vertebra at all. How could they say this? How could they be such, such liars? So for example, if I find a horse bone, let's say a horse femur, like some kind of proto-horse femur or, you know, equid femur, let's just call it, I think it's fair for me to assume that the horse's, like, humerus is similar to other horse humeri on the basis of the femur. Why? Because if the femur is similar to living horses, and I can infer on the basis of the femur that it is a quadruped, which you generally can, then the humerus has to accommodate that. Therefore, if the pelvis is indicative of a biped, then the spine has to accommodate that. That is why the lumbar lordosis is inferred. Now, there's another thing that's important with regard to this section, and that is this. In the discovery video, which a video is cited, Lovejoy explains that chimpanzees and gorillas have on average three or four lumbar vertebra. This is true but that Artie probably had six, in parentheses, like modern humans. Humans don't typically have six lumbar vertebra, Mr. Roop. They have five. Monkeys have six. So what is basically going on here is that Artie has the primitive lumbar condition. Australopiths tend to have the derived condition, having five lumbar vertebra like modern humans. What's the problem here? that you didn't know the number of vertebra a modern human has in their lumbar region. What the heck is wrong with you? You're supposed to be a biologist. You're supposed to, this is supposed to be equivalent to a dissertation. What is going on? In the Artie's ape teeth section, we get the following. A major justification for the inclusion of Artie in the human lineage has to do with the size and shape of the canine teeth. Humans have non-threatening diamond-shaped canines distinct from the larger, sharper canines found in apes. 
For this reason, evolutionists typically regard smaller, less intimidating canines to be a human trait. Since Artie was found to have consistently or considerably smaller canines than most apes, it was used as evidence to support the, the assertion that this was our evolutionary ancestor. They go on and cite some reasons for this being proposed, and then they say the so-called reduced canines were cited as evidence that Artie was evolving to become more human. Then they cite Esteban Sarmiento, who is listed as, and I quote, <laughs> respected evolutionary paleoanthropologist Esteban Sarmiento, uh, who appeared on the TV show Monster Quest, by the way. I actually don't have an issue with Esteban Sarmiento, not really. I think most of his work is okay, even though some of it is a little bit lacking. But, like, just so you know. <laughs> so they quite they quote from Esteban Sarmiento, 14 of the 26 characters in Table 1 common to Artipithecus and Australopithecus are in the canine premolar complex. However, reliance on the canine premolar complex to diagnose hominids in a classical sense has misdiagnosed Miocene fossil apes like Oreopithecus and Ramapithecus. When is this citation from? Uh, 2010. So this is why you should be a little bit wary. He's probably using Ramapithecus in the sense of its original designation as having reduced canines and then turning out it didn't. It was just female Sheepapithecus. Um, as early human ancestors. Character polarity for this complex is not as clear cut with many early hominoids, especially females, often showing a human-like condition. Wrong. And I get to be the expert on this because my thesis, my master's thesis was actually on um, the sexual dimorphism of living primate canine teeth. And my master's re or my PhD dissertation is on, and I'm presenting a poster on my preliminary results this March, the dimorphism of early Miocene apes. So I actually get to talk about this, like the expert in the room, as compared to Sarmiento, because I like I'm, I'm publishing on this. <laughs> um, approximation to human-like canine premolar complex, therefore, does not indicate that Artipithecus is a hominid or ancestral to Australopithecus any more than it indicates that Oreopithecus and the orangutan-like females of Sheopithecus, just like I said, uh, both of which also share the human-like premolar canine complex, are hominids or represent a descendant ancestor continuum. Okay, so then they show this picture. Let's finish this part and then we'll dig into it. Sarmiento points to other extinct apes, blah, 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 blah. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then says, if some of, if the same dental features found in apes that are understood by paleo experts to be outside the human lineage, how can they be considered a hallmark of human evolution? As noted, the observed differences among living and extinct apes, including arty and canine size and shape, are a reflection of dietary behavior not evolutionary ancestry. So let's discuss this. First and foremost, canine teeth are rarely related to diet. There are almost always a uh, relationship between intrasexual, intrasexual, and sometimes intrasexual competition. The bigger the canines, the more you can intimidate other members of your group and get what you want. This is why gibbons who are monogamous, that is to say they're pair bonded, um, and live in small territories. Males and females both have huge canines to defend their territory, whereas sort of um, the dimorphic apes tend to have males being highly aggressive and females being more passive. Let's talk about dimorphism. Most apes have big canine teeth. Humans have small canine teeth, and Artipithecus's canine teeth are somewhere in the middle. They're big for a hominin, but they're small for an ape, and ours are puny for an ape. Now, typically, as I said previously, the canine teeth are used for aggressive displays within the species. Some apes are highly sexually dimorphic in their canine teeth, like gorillas, with males having canines that are, you know, 1.6 times the size of females, same with orangutans. Chimpanzees and bonobos have considerably less dimorphic canine teeth than that, with male canines being around 30% taller or larger than females. That's not that much, and bigger females can dip into the male range. And then you have things like humans and gibbons, where males and females have monomorphic canine teeth, where any canine tooth cannot be individually sexed because there is such heavy overlap. Artipithecus has these types of monomorphic canine teeth. We know because we've got a big old sample of them. Now, is this type of monomorphism comparable to any other Miocene ape living at the time? Decidedly, no. Not only are the canine teeth reduced in height, but they're reduced in overall dimensions as well, and they're reduced in both sexes. This is something that we see in no other ape, like none, living during the Miocene. 
Some of the apes both have hypertrophied or big canine teeth in the sexes, and some have bigger in male or reduction in the male or reduction in the female. None get as small as Artipithecus, and none happen in both sexes in the same way that they happen in Artipithecus. More importantly, Artipithecus also has an impact on the canine P3 shearing complex. So what does that mean? What on earth does that mean? Let me get some uh, materials out to show you. Chimpanzees use their first premolar, this molar right here, which almost looks like a mini canine, to sharpen the top uh, the maxillary canine, the top canine tooth. So when they bite down, they literally shear the back of that canine onto the front of the premolar, keeping it sharp, right? This is something that they do to maintain the integrity of the weapon, which they do not use to eat things Sanford and Rube. The P3 honing complex in Artipithecus is almost entirely absent. So not only do we not see the type of dual sex canine reduction in any other Miocene ape, but we also don't see that P3 reduction in any other Miocene ape. It is decidedly unique. The most important part of this is the reduction starts with Sahelanthropus chidensis and it finishes in Australopiths, which have monomorphic canine teeth despite their dimorphic body size. So to be abundantly clear, Sarmiento is wrong here. Like I feel confident in just saying that. And not only do I work on teeth and dimorphism, but many of the people in my department do as well. We talked about this ad nauseum. It is simply not the case that Artipithecus ramidus's condition is seen to the degree that it's seen in anything earlier. Their portion on the hands and feet basically boils down to C, it's got a divergent halix, therefore case closed, uh, which is silly. That's not how any kind of morphology study is done, especially with regard to locomotion. But for what it's worth, they quote uh, Owen Lovejoy and Tim White. They quote Bill Jungers again. And they're basically saying, uh, yeah, like, look at the look at the foot. Looks just like a, looks like a chimp's foot, right? Here's Artipithecus rambidus, and then here's a chimp, and here's a human. Notably, the halix of Artipithecus rambidus is more divergent than a chimp, again, which is interesting. Um, and then they say that the hands are ape-like because of the curved phalanges and indicate arboreal locomotion. And interestingly enough, they actually have to come to terms with something interesting over here that, that I'm going to read real quick. Uh, they say one of the key differences between Artie and modern apes listed by Lovejoy and colleagues is the absence of the locking wrists that afford quadrupedal apes the ability to bear weight on their knuckles like chimps and gorillas. This is cited as evidence that Artie was not like any living ape, but nevertheless the surprising ancestor of both humans and chimps. Yet just because Artie did not have a knuckle locking wrist typical of chimpanzees, it does not follow that it was an early human ancestor. Most primates are not stiff wristed knuckle walkers, baboons and monkeys walk on their palms. So basically what they're noting here, they're just having to admit like, yeah, like if Artie uh, is to be believed that it, it didn't have locking, you know, it wasn't a knuckle walker, it couldn't be a knuckle walker. This is the same problem they have with Australopiths. They can't be knuckle walkers. And yet the frame and magnum entirely precludes quadrupedalism for something like Artipithecus. So um, I'd like to go over the hands and feet a little bit because I think that that's the best case that they can make, right? That they can say, look, the feet, the feet look like they could preclude bipedalism. Can they? Let's find out. So this is a paper titled uh, Combining Prehension and Propulsion, the Foot of Artipithecus Ramidus. It's by Lovejoy and Bruce Latimer. And um, boy, that looks like a familiar figure, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem strange that they can pull the figures from these papers and then not read the papers? Because specifically, there's the foot of Artipithecus Ramidus. Again, this is free on ResearchGate, all open access from now on. And uh, they do some interesting stuff with body mass here. Uh, but this is what I want. First, that's metatarsal, that's nice. Uh, this is what I want here. This section titled the first ray during terrestrial gait. So the first ray is the that divergent toe for Artie. So, you know, the your big toe and the ray is just in reference to the full, the phalange, the metatarsal, um, all the way back to the tarsals. The dorsal articular margin of the first metatarsal head of the Artie specimen pre preserves detailed evidence of how Artipithecus ramidus used its foot during some locomotor settings. The dorsal surface bears two symmetrically placed and equal sized V-shaped facets separated by a central non-articular isthmus. Each facet appears to have been generated by axial rotation of the raised proximal phalanx at its MP joint. So basically there's two different marks for two different locomotor um, movements of this halix. 
They go on to discuss how the foot seems to have a different locomotor style for arboreality versus for its terrestrial movement. The MT1's dorsomedial, sorry, dorsomedial facet would have therefore generated, been generated by internal rotation that occurred when the foot was on, in placed on terrestrial substrate with the first ray in substantial abduction because it exhibits no doming. So abduction means away from the body. So the point is, is that it's actually pulling that toe out to stabilize itself uh, once, it, once it is on the ground. Um, and they note that this is decidedly different from what we see in Pan and Gorilla. Um, the similar rotations occur regularly in the MT1s of Pan and Gorilla. They are most often asymmetrical and appear to be generally deeper. In some gorilla specimens, the medial facet is more prominent than the lateral, which suggests that during terrestrial locomotion, greater relative loads were imposed on the gorilla MT1s than in Ornithopithecus ramidus. This would at first seem to be a paradox because African apes are not habitual bipeds. However, Ornithopithecus ramidus retains primitive features in the tarsal joint, uh, or sorry, yeah, in the tarsal joint rigidity uh, along the mid tarsus and soft tissue characters that likely accompanied uh, allowing uh, excuse me powerful plantar flexion about its lateral metatarsal heads, including what must have been a substantial contribution by the um, perineal compartment. The African apes, by contrast, have lost such capacity in favor of substantial mid tarsal laxity. So their argument basically is that the nature of the big toe and the rigidity of the foot as a whole actually would have aided it in being bipedal as compared to modern African apes. This is not what you would expect in something that is identical to a, a chimpanzee or a gorilla, and is particularly telling when in conjunction with the other necessarily bipedal and orthograde characteristics, such as the shape of the pelvis and the location of the foramen magnum. Let's read up on their conclusion here, uh, just so you can understand what they're trying to say. Artipithecus ramnus is the only known hominid with an abducent great toe. Its foot, along with the other postcranial elements, indicates that it is that the late Miocene hominoid, or hominid, excuse me, precursors of Artipithecus ramnus practiced mixed arboreal and terrestrial locomotions, during which the lateral forefoot became extensively adapted to upright walking, even as the medial forefoot retained uh, adaptations for arboreal exploitation. During the gait cycle, fibularis longus contraction would have also stabled the proximal ankle joints. The moderate to strong Taylor delineation, or sorry, uh, yeah, declination, excuse me, of the angle between the trochlea and the angle's axis of rotation in combination with the clear evidence of the abductor stabilization during the hip stance phase together suggests that the foot was placed near the midline. The knee may have been in greater external rotation than is typical in human and Australopithecus um, types of locomotion. Artipithecus ramidus likely relied on situationally dependent lordosis to generate functional hip abduction during stance phase. Combined with the pedal characteristics described here, this suggests a form of primitive terrestrial bipedality in which the foot was in place at, at or only slightly lateral to the midline with great toe typically in abduction, so away, as typically seen in African great apes, and the lateral forefoot in external rotation. So this thing is walking in a very strange way as necessitated by its morphology. Um, and they go on to kind of conclude with this. Hominid morphology has often been presumed to evolve from ancestral morphotypes like those of extant African apes. Artipithecus ramidus now establishes this is not the case. This hominid foot was instead derived from one substantially less specialized. The takeaway from the foot is not that it is clearly one of a biped, but rather one that allowed for and indicates habitual bipedality. So in conjunction again with everything else, this is not common sense belonging to a, a quadruped like San Group would have you believe. The hands have curved phalanges, but hands in humans are actually a primitive trait. Like we have long thumbs and pretty short fingers like proconsul and a lot of earlier Miocene apes. And this primitive condition is not changed super substantially through human evolution. Although there are some very key changes that allowed us to use precision grip and facilitate our sort of um, uh, finer dexterous movements that we tend to do to get what we want, right? Like we have these very fine motor skills. We'll get to that some point down the line, but the overall skeletal morphology isn't very different. So like, yeah, like already has curved phalanges. So does Australopithecus. They still lived in the trees part of the time. No one that I know today is denying that. So let's kind of finish off with the conclusion here. A famous advocate of human evolution, Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So yes, famous evolution enjoyer, Carl Sagan. 
While the RD team has made extraordinary claims, they have certainly not demonstrated extraordinary evidence. The remains attributed to Artie and its kind, Artipithecus ramnus, do not represent convincing evidence pointing to the early ancestor of man. All the, all the major features cited by the discovery team in their attempt to place Artie in the direct human lineage are based on highly questionable reconstructions and inferences. Except, by the way, when Sanford and Rupp want to use some aspects of the reconstruction to support their claim, like we saw with the skull. The quality of the evidence itself is very poor. The bones were unarticulated and loosely scattered across miles of the Afro landscape and were very poorly preserved. Poorly preserved, yes, scattered across miles and miles of the Afar landscape, it depends on which individual we're talking about. The incomplete, disintegrating, and scattered bone fragments made reconstruction an act of faith. No, it made it very difficult. In fact, it took 17 years. I don't know how much more you can expect of someone. Sanford and group would prefer it if when something is difficult, you just say, mm, sorry, it can't be done. It would be an act of faith. The original anatomical orientation of key diagnostic bones, particularly the severely crushed skull and hip, were lost forever, too poorly preserved to enable accurate reconstruction. There is zero support whatsoever for this sentence. It is simply assertive. Um, and the opposite is true. As we saw with the skull and pelvic reconstruction, certain aspects of these are like unavoidable. The anterior inferior uh, uh, iliac spine, or yeah, iliac spine is one example, and the foramen magnum's location um, in relation to other landmarks of the skull is another. Okay. Um, it's no wonder it took nearly 20 years to digitally manipulate the remains to the satisfaction of the discoverers. That's just so vile. Such a vile characterization. Many experts in the field have openly questioned Artie's actual morphology and true manner of locomotion of Chris and have criticized the speculative reconstructions and inferences derived by them. No. Bernard Wood... Terry Harrison and uh, Esteban Sarmiento have in have like each one as a pair and one independently criticized aspects of particular inferences of these reconstructions. So, for instance, Bernard Wood and um, Terence Harrison are not saying that Artipithecus was not orthograde or bipedal some of the time. In fact, they said exactly the opposite, as we saw. Um, and Sarmiento doesn't suspect that it's not hominin, right? He just is wrong, frankly. I hate to tell you this, but like, I used to be an expert on one thing and he happened to delve into that topic. Leading evolutionary paleo experts have challenged virtually every claim put forward by the Discover team regarding RD. Detailed criticisms have been reported in numerous peer-reviewed journals, blah, 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 blah. The competing view that RD is merely an extant ape. No one said this, by the way. I hope you noticed. No one said this in any of their criticisms. Sarmiento, Wood and Harrison, all three think it's still probably a hominin, not just an extinct ape. Okay. Despite what the Discovery clean team claims, there's no evidence Artie had a human-like hip. There is no evidence uh, that Artie's skull and teeth were evolving towards becoming human. Artie's anterior position for him and is very questionable and would not warrant its placement in the human lineage. The limb proportions, hands and feet are mis unmistakably that of an ape. There's no legitimate evidence to suggest Artie walked up right like humans. The traits presented as evidence uh, that already was in the human lineage are the very same features currently seen in living apes as noted by leading evolutionary paleo experts wrong, right? We've already established this in the hour and some change that we've been discussing this. Um, and then they go on to discuss the Trachea's prints. Um, already was dated, latest developments, fall 2017. Let's see. Already was dated 4.4 million years ago. Yeah, it's the Trachea's prints. I think. Uh, despite the proposed blah, 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 and discovery made it fun. Yeah, it's the Trachea's prints. We've already covered this. Um, I don't think the Trachea's prints are footprints at all, uh, but if they are, there is absolutely no problem with them belonging to a Miocene ape, given many of the Miocene apes had orthograde postures. Okay, so that's the Artipithecus Ramidus chapter. In this chapter, we got to see some very big screw ups. The mistaking of the number of human lumbar vertebra being six instead of five, um, the like complete unawareness of the fossil material itself with regard to the foramen magnum, just a lot of flubs, very embarrassing and very indicative of the trust levels that you should be applying when you're reading contested bones. Again, as we move further and further into this text, we understand more and more just how bad this book is at like even remotely accurately representing the sources that it deigns to even cite, just completely putting aside the obfuscation of all the sources that it doesn't cite. And this is supposed to be, as we read, a PhD level uh, of, of effort. 
Um, yes, if you were getting your PhD in lying, I would agree. Aripithecus ramidus was probably bipedal on the ground. I think that there is almost no one who would disagree with that right now. It certainly had an upright posture, uh, and the support for that has to do again with that suite of characteristics that designate bipedality, the anterior frame and magnum, the shape of the pelvis. And remember that even if you dislike the reconstructions, there are aspects of the morphology of both of those that even if you're skeptical, should still lean it far towards that bipedalism. Um, at least when on the ground. This thing's probably a pretty primitive hominin, but it's a hominin nevertheless. That It's got the weird grasping toe that's really kind of uh, derived as compared to even extant apes, which is really interesting. It's a beautiful hominin with monomorphic canine teeth that suggests that it maybe lived in pair bonded groups, at least insofar as we can infer behavior from morphology. Uh, and it's my favorite. I think it's adorable. I, I love the idea of this like giant gibbon just living pair bonded together. Um, in the trees. Now, kind of bringing things full circle for those of you who made it through the entire video, here's the punchline to, uh, to the joke. While it may be that I've got, you know, some unusable toilet paper here due to the copious amounts of dog slobber uh, that is on it, I will be not wanting for any material to use in the bathroom, thanks to Contested Bones' Artipithecus Ramidus chapter.